Christ. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Blaine Christian Church. I'd like to welcome all of those who I see very often and some new faces. Welcome. Welcome to our service this morning. Um, I want to bring a couple things to your attention. Please take some time to read your announcements. A couple things I want to highlight are the women's retreat that's coming up in November and also Pi Day that's coming up in November. So if you haven't been able to sign up for your favorite job, please do so. We can always use your help. The also the um, box uh, for the children's Operation Children uh, Christmas is out there. So if there are things that you can help with that, that's also a great thing. My words for today are from a song. And it is, we are one Lord, united in your spirit. We are one Lord, united by your love. We are one Lord, one in heart and soul, gathered in your spirit. We are one. We are one, created by our Father. We are all different, but we are one. Please hold that close to your heart today as we listen to the message. With that, can we please stand and greet our neighbors with the peace of Christ? And stay standing for our praise songs. <laughs> pray. Lord God, whom we praise and adore, begin mighty deeds in us this hour. Send great hopes, fortify firm resolve, because the world needs the gospel, and Jesus Christ bids us share with all in need of the Savior. Amen. We fall down, we lay our crowns, and we
so I don't have any little ones out here, but I'll ask for all of your help. So I am going to give you the word for the day, and the word for today is one. So as I am speaking, every time you hear the word one, I want you to hold up your finger, okay? Just one. <laughs> Just one. <laughs> okay, so here I have a globe. And all of you obviously know what this is. It's the globe of our one world. Okay? And um, you've all heard the song that he, hold, he holds the whole world in his hands, right? And with that, he holds the mothers and the fathers and the sisters and the brothers and the wind and the rain and everybody he holds in his hand. So in the Bible, it tells us that Jesus prayed for us to be one. One to love one another and accept each other as God does so that we would have unity or be one. So what does this mean? I think it means that God created one world. How many worlds did he create? One, one. He created one world for lots of different people. And Jesus prayed that we would act like one. How can we do that? Well, one of the most important things we can do is love everyone. And I have to find us. Here we are. This is this is where we live. But did God want us to just love this one country? No, he wanted us to love this one world. If we didn't, that wouldn't be unity or one. God wants us to love everyone all over the world, just like he does. So can we remember that one world means one love? Can we pray? God, help us to love one another, just like you do. And thank you for making our one awesome, incredible world. Help us to be one in Christ. In your name, we pray. Good morning, everyone. Yeah. May we pray. Lord God, whom we praise and adore, begin mighty deeds in us this hour. Send great hopes, fortify firm resolve, because the world needs the gospel. And Jesus Christ bids us share with all in need of the Savior. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from Revelations 5, 1 through 8. It is on page, I don't know. Okay. It's in the The scroll and the lamb. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on a throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. 
He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He has, he had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out to, into all of the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne, and when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Our second reading today comes from John chapter 17, verses 1 through 12 and 15 through 17, and can be found on your pew Bibles on page 877. After Jesus said this, he looked toward the heaven, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come, glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you, for I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I prayed for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. I just want to say, I picture Jesus saying this prayer for each and every one of us, and it's glorious. Amen. Good morning. Are we okay? You can hear me? Rita, thank you. Bob, thank you. And maybe some of you are wondering a little bit, how, do, how am I going to sort of put together that, this wonderful passage from John that Bob just read with this wonderful passage from Revelation 5 that Rita just read? Well, bear with me, let's say. And, and I have to tell you that I'm... I'm um, you know, the words that come out of my mouth are not Pastor Dave's or Pastor Bob's. They're, they're mine. So don't blame them if I say something that offends you, okay? All right. Well, last week, we talked about this right here. You know, as I told you, I'm a retired high school public teacher, 38 years. And in 
my classroom the following day after a lesson I would always review. So I know it's been a week, whether you were here last week or perhaps watched online or weren't even here, but here are some of the things we talked about. I wanted you to understand the four great questions I think everyone has in their lives. You know, who am I? Why am I here? What am I supposed to do, which we're really going to talk about today? And then what happens after I die? And then I talked with the Good Samaritan in particular, who are my neighbors? Those wonderful questions that Jesus answered from that teacher of the law when he asked, what do you know about eternal life? Asked about heaven. And then when Jesus took full control of the situation, he wanted to take it back. So he asked, well, who's my neighbor? So when Jesus talks about Samaritans, I asked you, who are the Samaritans, those hated people for the Jews? Who are the Samaritans in your life? So for this week, I've titled the sermon, He Did His Job. What does it mean when you hear the words, just do your job? Oh, I'm after an answer. Go ahead. What does it mean when someone says, just do your job? Won't they just do their jobs? Just do your job. What does it mean? Get out of your face. What else? Do what you're supposed to do. What else? Do it well. Use your gifts. Okay, so a little bit different meanings for different people, which is usually the case. Well, I heard this over and over in my household while growing up. And Carolyn and I continued this in our household with our own children. It meant for us, show up and work until the job, whatever it is, is done. It was not under promise and over deliver. How many of you have heard that? Just, I like people who under promise and over deliver. And, and if that's you, that's okay. It's not me. Because if I hear the word under promise, I hear a lie. That person is lying to me. So it wasn't about under promising and over deliver. It was about delivering. Pure and simple, it was about work ethic and personal integrity, but I know that everyone here knows this. You're not different, and I'm here to tell you neither was Jesus. In the reading from John 17 today, we find Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, here we go. In this reading, he's just been in the upper room with the disciples. He said basically his last words to them for quite a while. And he's praying to the Father, knowing exactly, at least in my mind, what's going to happen to him. So think about that. And think about what he said in his prayer. Uh, Carolyn, yeah, it says, in one of the things that Bob read to us today in verse 4, it says, I brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And with Jesus, this is interesting. For me, my job as a high school teacher, I loved it. I truly had a passion to be in that classroom. It wasn't a job. I got to do something that I loved every day. But it was still a chore at times. It was still very difficult at times, but I love doing it. So my question to you is, Jesus, know what he's, he knows what's going to happen. Is he going to love doing his job? It's a curious question and one I think we need to answer. So he's near Jerusalem. There has been a plot out to kill him, and they would have taken him in if they could have just gotten to him. But he's remember, he's ridden on the donkey into Jerusalem. People have laid 
uh, palm branches in front. The crowds are huge. And as I intimated last week, crowds make Rome nervous because they can just absolutely erupt. And the Romans did not have enough people there to defend if the crowds erupted. So this is just before Jesus is arrested and taken away. Notice what he says while praying. He says he's finished his work. Interesting. I look at that and I say, well, he hasn't gone to the cross yet. So how can he say, I finished my work? So what are we talking about here? In verse 12, if you'd put that up, while I was with them, I protected them. Who's them? Okay, good. And kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed. Who's that going to be? Good. You guys are great. So that scripture would be fulfilled. So he's protected his disciples. Protected them from what? Okay. And in verse 15, if we look at that, here's the wonderful part of it. And there are many wonderful parts. Because as Bob mentioned, I'm so glad he did. This prayer, he's praying for others. Wow. Jesus prays for the continued protection of his disciples. He knows that he's going home. Where's home? Where's home for Jesus? It's not this earth. Where's home for Jesus? He's going home, but they're going to remain. Can you imagine? Jesus knows what's coming next to him, the beatings, the insults. His most trusted abandoning him. Remember Peter's denial and everybody just scattering the crown of thorns, the nails, and a crucifixion that is so intense and cruel that none of us can even imagine what it was like. And yet, he prays for his disciples, but not just them. I'd like to continue with this, a section I did not have read. So in John 17, 20 through 24, here we go. This is wonderful. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them, I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. You're going, okay, interesting word. Jesus prays for, oh, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also. For those who will believe in me through their message. Do you know who that is? That's all of you sitting here as I stand. Jesus is praying for you and he's praying for me. Wow. But he did his job. Wow. But he's not done. So what's going on here? But as Jenny read this morning, I so much appreciate that children's sermon because it mirrored a lot of what I said last week. And then the scripture here, let's take a look. That they, all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Notice, he's praying for us, praying for his disciples, he's praying for all of us, and then all that we will reach. It says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am. Is this all of it? There's, a, there's some more, right? That's all right. That's okay. Uh, I have my phone up here because I ran long last week as a classroom teacher. I'm programmed for 55 minutes. And they tell me I can't do a 55 minute sermon. 
Oh yeah, here we go. I have given them glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Oh, his last prayer before he moves on up to heaven. Notice what he says. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Keep looking at that word love because I think it's the key to understand he did his job. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am. And I don't think he's talking about the Garden of Gethsemane here. I think he's talking about his home in heaven. And to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. Please understand, as I read this and I see this, before the creation of the world, he knew you. He knew you. And just like Jesus had his job to do. So do we. And why is Jesus praying for his disciples and for us when he should be praying for himself? If I knew what was, I was about to endure, I would be praying for me, but he didn't. So let's move on to John 18. Okay? This was not read this morning. Would you? Yeah. Okay. So here we go. Jesus and his disciples are in the garden very, very late at night. And if you remember from another scripture passage, he takes his trusted three, who are Peter, James, and John, right? And the other disciples are there, except for Judas, because Judas is, okay, and they got the scenario set, okay? The Romans and the Sanhedrin have reached an agreement to have Jesus arrested on the charge of sedition. But arresting Jesus is very, very problematic. They can't get to him. Why? Because of the crowds. And because Jesus is slippery. Several times in scripture it says, and they went to arrest him, or the crowds went to make him king, and he just sort of slipped through their fingers because... That was not his job, to be king or to be arrested yet. To arrest him in public would cause a riot, and on top of that, they can't find him. But Judas, for the silver, has agreed to betray Jesus, and you know this story. So late at night, a Roman contingent and temple guards led by Judas come for Jesus. So let's pick up this story. It's right here. When he had finished pr praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew that place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers. That would have been Roman soldiers, by the way, and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying, don't get, let this get lost on you, torches, lanterns, and weapons. And this wouldn't have been two or three Roman soldiers. This could have been hundreds. They were coming for him. This would have been, Roman soldiers never went anywhere to do something like this in twos and threes. They went in power. So, if we keep going, it says, Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, that's where I get this, went out and asked them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. And notice what he said. And notice what happens. I am he, Jesus said, and Judas the traitor was standing there with him. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the what? 
Here are all the Roman soldiers and the temple guard. When Jesus said, I am he, they just absolutely fall back and boom, they go to the ground. Why is that? Because he invoked his lion's name. He was the lion of Judah at that point. He was God at that point. And in the presence of God, everybody falls. And they did that. So now, what's going on? Why did he do that? He was there to be eventually be crucified. Why did he have all of them fall to the ground? This is interesting, I think. For many years, when I've read this passage, I thought that Jesus was just playing his what I call God card. He did that every once in a while. He would play his God card when he would disappear or when he would do something that was, quote, high and mighty. And I thought, okay, he's just showing them, if I really want to, this is who I am. But I, now, after reading that wonderful prayer, in chapter 17, I think perhaps there's a different reason. Because here's what happens next. When again, he asked them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. Only it's a whole different tense now. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. Let's keep going. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of them you gave me. Then here it is. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put the sword away. Now here's a whole Roman contingent with swords. And the temple guard would have been armed also. And their whole goal was to arrest Jesus, but also they wanted Jesus dead. Here would have been a perfect time. This should have been a bloodbath and a slaughter. When Peter did that, because they had the disciples contained, it was late at night, nobody would have known. That should have been a bloodbath. But I think the Romans were afraid. I think that's why Jesus had them go to the ground. He wasn't done with his job yet. Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrest, arrested Jesus and they bound him. Make no mistake. Jesus was never, ever out of control. He was always in control. People that say he was a victim, I'm telling you, that is not true. There's no victim in Jesus. He did what he was supposed to do. Dying was just a part of it. He rose from the dead to be seen by hundreds, and we know why he died and why he rose. And when he went to the cross, so did his movement. But then he came back. So was that the end of Jesus's job when he was crucified and rose again? Can we move on to Revelation now? All right, can we move on to Revelation? You know, people will tell me, Gary, you can't do Revelation. Nobody likes Revelation. How many of you are confused by Revelation? Well, both my hands will go up. Or at least left wondering. It keeps so many from reading that wonderful scripture. But let's look at it again. The disciple John, a very old man, and the only disciple left who has not been martyred, is taken up into heaven. He's on the island of Patmos. For some reason, they've left John alone. Of course, it's prophecy that they would leave John alone. Whether in a vision or in a spirit, I don't know, but John sees the future and we are allowed a glimpse of what will happen. 
So let's pick up the narrative. Then I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. You go, Gary, I don't understand. Well, let's keep moving on. Take a look in three, but no one in heaven or earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and I wept. In Greek, it gushed. He is just gushing because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Let's keep going. Then one of the elders said to me, and I can just see this, don't weep. See, the lion of Judah, from the tribe at the root of David has triumphed. He is able to open up the scroll and it's seven seals. You see, I don't think his job is done yet. He still has that to do because if he wouldn't have gone to the cross, that wouldn't happen. And if that doesn't happen, we don't have eternal life, guys, pure and simple. So I talk about Jesus doing his job. Jesus did his job because he loved us. God gave Jesus that job because he loved us. And I'm going to encourage you to keep reading on in Revelation 5 and Revelation 6. It's wonderful. It is just absolutely wonderful. John was very clear. We could not and all of creation could not be redeemed until Jesus died for us and then rose from the dead. He paid for our sins with his blood. And make no mistake, this was planned by God from the very beginning, to be redeemed, to be brought back to him, something undeserved, unrivaled, and unprecedented. God's for love for us has never wavered, and neither has Jesus' love for us. Our eternity with him has been sealed when Jesus broke the seals of that scroll. Jesus did his job. Now, do yours. May we pray? Our gracious Lord, thank you so much that you've loved us so much that Jesus went to the cross. And he prayed for us. And he loves us with an unconditional love that we cannot earn. Lord, give us every opportunity to pass that along to others. Amen.
it's now time for a very important part of our service and that is if you have not accepted jesus christ as your savior to come forward this is all new to me because i don't go to first service so i don't know all of you and we always want to make sure we give that opportunity uh i guess you could accept the lord anywhere you want to be in your car at home or out in the woods in your tree stand but there's a special feeling of coming forward in the church and not only is it a blessing to you but it's a blessing to the church as well so as they sing this second uh, song if now you would feel like you'd like to come forward and accept christ or if you simply want to join the church would be the time to come forward Thank you. Now it's time for our joys and concerns. And seeing how they let me come up here, I always emphasize very strongly that you fill out your prayer card. It makes it so much easier for the person doing this. And, you know, I have horrible handwriting and horrible spelling. And for me to try to write them down as you're saying it just don't work. And <laughs> I've looked at some of them prayer cards, and I'm not the only one. So at this time, if we have uh, prayers or concerns, praises, this would be the time to let them be known. Bob Bell.
Heavenly Father, what a joy it is to come into your house, Lord, and together with your church that gathers here at Blaine each week, and what a, what a time and what a privilege it is for me to just be able to say a prayer on behalf of these people. We have a wonderful church, a wonderful uh, congregation, and, and we love each other, and we thank you for that, God, and we thank you that you hear these prayers and that you will answer these prayers in the only and best way that possible, Lord. Sometimes we don't understand, but we always know, Father, that your word says that all things work together for good with those who love you. So we lift up these prayers to you, Father, believing that you will answer these prayers in the way that you see right. And we just pray this in the name of Jesus, and we pray the prayer that you have taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, and that we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. Now it's time to prepare our hearts for communion. And do you sing a communion song? Pardon? Oh, okay. Communion is one of the oldest sacraments in the church. Followed through in most Christian churches as a weekday observance. It's a very, very important time. It's a time of hope and remembrance of what Christ did for us on the cross, but it's also a time of uh, examination and reflection on our own life and how we're responding to that. So let's have a prayer. Lord, as we come to the table and take part in this wonderful sacrament, may we be still and listen quietly to hear you speaking to us. Clean our hearts and may we go out and tell others about the blessings we receive every day from you. We praise and worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. The night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and broke it. He said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and said, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. All are welcome to come forward and take me in this. Who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness?
God so amazing. Jesus Messiah, name above all. Amen. Mm-hmm.